Ladies and gents, today's lesson is all about Bridgerton English. I get the hype, I'm part of the hype, and apart from the lavish outfits, landscapes, and extraordinarily beautiful people, Bridgerton comes charged with amazing English expressions. And while many can find these expressions outdated, they can certainly help you achieve a better understanding of the Georgian era between the 18th and the 19th century. And why not Regency novels if you're a fan of the genre? A better understanding of how language was a perfect reflection of society at that time and how it has consequently evolved. So why do they say ton in Bridgerton? I've heard expressions such as all the ton was at the ball last night. And at first, I was convinced it was linked to the suffix at the end of the nobility surname, since our main families are the Bridgertons and the Featheringtons. But I was wrong. The ton actually refers to the English high society during the Regency era, from the royals to the gentry, and the gentry means upper class. It derives from the French les bontons, which means those with good manners, those who are proper in fashion, style, and etiquette. There was a bit of an obsession with everything French during that era. People spoke French, they imported fabrics, wine, materials. So this translated in the language as well. Where people adopted and started using French terminology, sometimes excessively, in order to separate themselves linguistically, I am so sorry about this, from the commoners. A commoner was an ordinary person who did not belong to nobility, and calling somebody a commoner or a simpleton was a grave insult. Another term we often hear in Bridgerton is modiste. We shall visit the modiste. A purely French term because the English dressmaker or seamstress didn't sound so chic. See? Here's another one, chic, which means cool and fashionable. Even today, there's a strong French influence in the English language in words like garage, reservoir, connoisseur, facade, bachelor and bachelorette, and the list may go on forever, even with the long game. Ta-da! Today, we know this as a tobacco brand, but in the 19th century, it was a great pastime for the whole family. The game actually has its origins in the 16th century, and it consisted in getting your ball in a hole, like so many other games, or through a hole in this case, which goes to show we haven't really changed much. Another tendency among the ton was using extremely intricate constructions and elaborate syntax instead of just one word. Heaven forbid they should sound like commoners. So why say wife when you can say an amiable partner with whom one may share a pleasant life? I wrote everything down. Why say I'm eager when you can say I shall be waiting with bated breath. <sighs> this is bated breath. Why say want to dance when you can say I can only hope I shall be afforded the pleasure of a dance. Why say one sec when you can say I shall be there anon? Anon means shortly. You can see our tendency now to shorten everything in order to optimize time. We don't even say one second, but one sec. And that's perfectly fine and socially acceptable nowadays in modern times. Instead of saying okay, the ton would say that would be most agreeable. Instead of saying he doesn't like long walks, the ton would say he doesn't take kindly to unending promenades or promenades. Pay attention to this word because it, it can be pronounced promenades in American English and promenades in British English. I love the ton. Why resume yourself to just one word when you have so many at your disposal? Another linguistic perk is using modal verb should instead of would. I should like to speak to you later, which sounds so unnatural right now, but so cool. And then of course, your everyday glossary should include the following terminology. A chamber pot. I'll have the servants empty your chamber pot or pots. This contraption is a portable toilet for nocturnal use in the bedroom. Courses. My courses are due next week. This means to get your period, your courses. 
Make haste the expression you've heard throughout season one and season two, which means hurry up, come on, hurry. Another particular thing I noticed, telling your age is also something entirely different in that era. I've heard I'm six to 20. That means I'm 26. I'm six to 30, I'm 36. <laughs> the snuff. Now you've seen Queen Charlotte sniffing a reddish powder during her encounters at the palace. And this is just ground up tobacco for a quick hit of nicotine. Now, let us move on to love. We've sure waited long enough. But first, remember you can find my books on Amazon if you are a teacher or student. And I'll make sure to drop a link below as well. The courtship is a complicated affair. In the Georgian era, between the 18th and the 19th century, the social season was the time of year London society devoted to events. And these events were all about finding a husband for the ladies of age, socializing, and of course, gossip. For feather frocked young women, coming out marked their official entry in high society. Also known as the viewing, proud parents would grandly display their daughters at balls and events, hoping to secure a suitable husband and join fortunes. That's right, back in the day, your mama was your very own personal tender. Young ladies and gents always had a chaperone, which is a third party overseeing the event, whether it's a ball or tea. As a young woman in your prime, certain qualities were required in order to entrap a man, since they were all looking for a young lady of fine breeding coming from a good family, excellent hips for childbearing, self-explanatory, a nimble-footed candidate, this means a dynamic dancer. Accomplished in needlework and piano forte. Reputation was highly regarded, so you were unlikely to find a match if people regarded you as a light skirt, meaning loose with your affections, or had an ugly countenance. Countenance, facial expression. Even dubious parentage. This means if one's family is considered improper, if you don't come from a good family. And a good family is a combination of successful endeavors from estate and fortune to healthy siblings. Things were a lot more permissive for men, and this only goes to show how far we've come as women. But if a man was depicted as a rake, which also means this lovely garden tool right here, his prospects didn't look so good. Dating to the 17th century, the term rake was used to describe a young man prone to immorality, excessive drinking, gambling, and finding himself in compromising situations with members of the opposite sex. How about members of the same sex? Why is this not even mentioned? We all remember the Bridgerton ladies taking to the dance floor with a dance card attached to their wrists. This was to keep track of their dance partners. As far as I know, they had a limited number of dances available and therefore dance partners. It was unbecoming for a lady to dance too much or more than twice with the same partner at the same ball if they were not engaged. The men were also the ones in charge of making the first move and a dance invitation was the best way to get to know a lady and her interests. After a ball, a single lady of age would receive suitors at home bearing flowers and gifts, always chaperoned of course, and they would even arrange promenades to get to know each other. And on this note, let us end the video with declarations of love. I'm gonna read you some. You are the bane of my existence and the object of all my desires. The bane of my existence, the bane means the source of all my stress and anxiety. <laughs> you are the bane of my existence. What is it truly to admire a woman, to look at her and feel inspiration, to delight in her beauty so much so that all your senses crumble, that you would willingly take on any pain, any burden for her, to honor her being with your deeds and words. This is what a true poet describes. Benedict Bridgerton. I really like Benedict. I mean, I'm rooting for him with all of my heart. And now one from the Duke. 
Everything I told the queen was true. I cannot stop thinking of you. From the mornings you ease to the evenings you quiet to the dreams you inhabit. My thoughts of you never end. I am yours, Daphne. I have always been yours. Woo! If you'd like part two, let me know down in the comments. I cannot wait to read your thoughts, but for now, I shall pay Mr. A a quick visit. See you next week. Bye!